Here, Sammy. Um, thank you for joining me, David. Yeah, man. Pleasure. Um, before we get started, um, David usually moderates the chat in these live sessions, so we are not moderated today because obviously he's on the live. Um, oh, Rigel is here. Rigel, welcome. Our other moderator is in the building, so we're going to be fine. Um, I have the chat up, so just a few housekeeping matters. Um, want to let people know that if you have questions, to please drop your questions in the chat. Um, and I definitely today is we're gonna. I know we're gonna have a lot of questions, and we're going to be um, trying to answer as many of those questions as possible. Today is sort of a working live learn from the pros, so we're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna go through a lot. So definitely have a notebook and a pen handy um, to, to take some notes because we're going to be going through quite a bit today. Today is a very important one. Um, if you haven't already subscribed on my Patreon page, um, if you're serious about learning um, mixing techniques and taking your audio engineering to the next level, um, the link is down below in the description of this video. Um, I actually shared some multi-tracks with our mix masters for, for them to be able to practice um, from our first masterclass and the reviews have been phenomenal. So thanks to everybody who has been supporting, who's already subscribed. And if you haven't already done so, uh, make sure you go ahead and do that. And obviously we have an incredible chat room and, and message board that's going on um, where people can collaborate greater and, and just really take it to the, to the next step and collaborate, even in this time when we're sort of sitting at home and unable to collaborate in person. So very excited about today. Um, and, and, and sharing with you guys and what you're able to learn from David, who is an absolute pro at what he does. And so, um, let's get into it. Mr. Virasami, how are you? Yeah, let's do it. I'm doing good. How are you? I am very good. Yeah, for those who don't know David, um, which I don't know if uh, there's anybody who doesn't know him on, on this broadcast. Hold on. Let me check my settings to make sure my do not disturb is on. Perfect. So for those who don't know Davin, um, Davin is the monitor engineer for Stephen Marley, the current monitor engineer for Stephen Marley. He is, I'm not going to call him by his um, term that we call him by for the Marley brothers, <laughs> but I'm going to give him a more glamorous term. Um, <laughs> Davin is the patch ninja <laughs> for the Marley Brothers, and he's also the audio crew chief, and we'll get into a little bit of what that means. Um, I see Ash. Um, Ash just logged in. Ash um, is our stage manager for Kayafest, one of the best yeah. stage managers on the planet, so big up, Ash. Um, big up, everybody watching. I know um, Drew, Drew Keys, who is our guest tomorrow, he's watching Brian Williamson. Um, Brian Williamson is also watching, and, and a whole bunch of people. So um, today is going to be good. I'm, I'm excited about today. But I met David um, when he was attending Metalworks, and the picture I used on Instagram was his, um, I think, a picture from when he was a student there, which he didn't like, so he created his own post um, <laughs> with his own pictures. But, um, yeah, I, I think um, from the moment we met, I realized that this dude was... Um, was going to go a long way in the industry. So tell us a little bit about your history. How how did you get into music or how did you know you wanted to, um, to, to, to pursue music and sound as a career? Like what age did that start for you? So, so my background, so I was born in a Christian family. So I was raised, you know, raised now in church, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, attending church pretty much every Sunday. Um, and, um, and on my mom's side of the family, right? So my aunties, like my, my uh, some of my aunts were like, you know, they would like, when family reunion, they always jam and play guitars and play like, you know, oh, Hotel nice. California, like all those, you know, songs. So that kind of like where it started. And then I think when it clicked was, so, you know, like we're talking back in Mauritius, right? When, when I'm actually, where I, I was actually born. So listen, like, you know how these churches work, like, you don't actually have a sound guy. So I'm not like, playing bass, playing keyboard, like, in church, and then realize, yo, like, there's no one doing sound. So I'm like, you know, me being curious, started, like, playing with a mixer, like, you know, doing right. this and this, and then right. I think that's where it kind of began. I was like, hey, 
this is cool. Like I would love to do that one day. And and talking with other people, and some people told me it's like, yeah, this like this is actually a career. Like there's people who become like life sound engineers. So then got me more curious. So serving church. So it was like it's crazy. Like one of my buddy Marisha still does it. He plays keyboard and mixes the service at the same time. Oh, really? Like, like this is how it used to be back in Mauritius. <laughs> Right. Um, for for those who don't know, where is Mauritius? All right. So Madagascar is easy because everyone have watched the movie Madagascar, right? So King, King Julian. So if you if, if you start from Africa here, you have Madagascar here. Mauritius is a small island somewhere here with about 1.5 million people. Um, yeah, like yeah, we're like an independent country, multicultural. Right. Um, like yeah like yeah it's a great place to live that's um, cool and is and is christianity like the main religion there or um well the main religion is hindu like hinduism right right because we have like like my roots are from india right colonized gotcha. by the british right yes um but you have like hindus muslim chinese people cool um people who don't believe in god as well like right. you know we have we have yeah it's a very multicultural island Cool. So you're 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 playing bass. I had no idea you played bass. That's crazy. How long have I known? This is nuts. You learn so much about people on these learn from the process. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Um. Yeah. So you're playing bass. You're you're yeah. mixing the service, and somebody kind of mentions to you that there are people in the world who mm. who um do sound as a career. Yeah. So at what yeah. point does it click? Um, are your parents supportive of you doing that? Like, at, at what point is that transition to now really focus on pursuing that? You know what's funny, though? When I tell people I do that full time, like, I just came back home. Like, I just went home in um, in January um, and, you know, talking to people. Like, people who are close to me, when I tell them this is what I do full time, it still doesn't click for them. Right. You know? Like, it's like, even I was growing up, like, even when I told my parents, like, you know, I still respect the decision, even the elders and everything, everyone always, because they were trying to look out for me and say, hey, right. is this a career? Like, are you are you going to be able to to feed yourself? You right, know? right. And like, is, is there an income for it? So, and, and that was the thing too. So I moved from Mauritius when I was about 19 years old. I went to Australia. Right. So I lived in Brisbane for about four years and a half. Um, I was working full-time, so I did my college there, working full-time for a law firm company, like an right. immigration law firm. Um, still not doing, like, a career in sound, right? Right. So, but I was involved in church, right? So we show up. I'm still part of the worship worship team, but um, also involved in the sound team as well. Like, when there's no one on the desk, I would always be mixing the service, right. like, back and forth like that. Um, yeah, it's still another career, I think. The career started when I moved to Canada in 2013. So I moved here in 2013, just doing like odd jobs here and there. Right. Um, work, work in a warehouse, like doing order picking. And then I moved to another company doing like um, taking care of all their shipping. Right. Um, like online shipping and all this stuff. And then it got to a point, actually, one of, I, I was, I remember that because I was talking to one of my uncle back in Mauritius, right? Uh -huh. Um. And then he was like, you've always wanted to do the music thing, haven't you? And I was like, yeah. He's like, so what are you waiting for? And right. I was like, and that's when it actually clicked. I was like, <clears throat> all right, maybe he's right. Like, am I going to work in a warehouse the rest of my life? You know, stuff like that, right? So then I found Metal Works Institute, right? So, so the thing with me was from a young age, I knew what I wanted to do. Right. But I also wanted to have a school that actually allows me to access the gears. I don't want to go to a school with like an analog console, you know, and like it's, it limits your practical knowledge. What are you trying right? to say about analog, bro? Like, <laughs> no, not, I'm not dissing analog. Uh, <laughs> trying try to call um, us old or yeah. something. I don't know. <laughs> but that's when it, that's when it, so then I found Mellow Works. I went for the open house. I was like, yo, this school actually had, is a school, has a studio, and it was also a, actual production company yeah so you know like i learned the the sc40 there yeah. so when i left school like all the values in toronto have most of them have sc40 so it was easy for me to get 
to get a job in venues in Toronto, just the fact that I was able to learn the console at school, right? So right. that's where it kind of like began. And I think we met in 2015 when you came and did the guest lecture at um, at Mellowworks. Right. And that's where the story of Dab and Reds began, you know? <laughs> so strange. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, I, and I think um, how we met is that you, um, oh, well, it, Veer, Veer commented, he said, I thought this was learned from the pros. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Veer. Hey, congratulations to Veer. Um, Veer, Veer is a father once again. Um, oh, congratulations. His yeah. wife had their, their second baby um, yesterday evening. So, mm -hmm. congratulations to pop of year um so so yeah so we we meet you um you 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 had a lot of questions um that, that when when we met that first time and and i kind of saw um a, a willingness to to learn and and um and, and a desire to to to, mm. to get more information which i've always I, I tend to talk a lot about um and I talked yesterday about those intangibles that allow you to get to 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 that next level, right? Mm. Um, which is which is really really I think eighty percent to ninety percent of what determines your trajectory as a, a as an audio engineer or as a touring professional. It's it's this desire to constantly learn and get better, and and so I I kind of saw that in you the first time we met. So. Um, you know how 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 has that affected um or or impacted your approach to what we, what you do cuz i mean you're you you kind of took the route of okay i want to do this thing professionally so let me find a school mm -hmm. some of us don't necessarily take that route right like some of mm -hmm. us go let me learn this thing prof professionally let me go find a production company or find somebody who's doing it and ask them to teach me a few things but mm -hmm. you obviously wanted to do it the the right well not there's no right or wrong way but yeah. you wanted to go through school and get proper professional like official training so how how has that desire for knowledge and 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 learning impacted your trajectory to this point um like here's the thing like i'm not saying like and that's the thing in our production world like some people have told me why did you go to school some people thinks it's a great idea. Some, some people think it's a bad idea. I've even told people who said, hey, I want to go to Melbourne. I was like, hey, why don't you spend a few weeks in a production company? And because at the same time, it's an investment. Like it's it's not cheap to go to Melbourne, you know, unless you successfully graduate and you get a grant from the government, etc. Like it's not cheap. Um, for me, it's always been like, you know, you want to start the foundation good. And the thing, and that's the thing which some people don't know too, is I did two programs at Melworks. I did the, the entertainment and business management and the life. I always wanted to do live. So I, that first program, I'm not saying it's pointless. Like if you want to do live, you go straight and do live sound, right? Why would you do a, a entertainment management program? But that program taught me a lot on how to actually, because that's the thing, I'm a freelance, right? So I need to treat myself as a business. How do I? How do I push my career forward? How do I get it to that place? And and I think the like I'm pretty I'm sure the business program taught me a lot about how to actually like connect with people. How do you build relationship with people in the industry? How and like even the bashing thing. Like I didn't want to just be a, an engineer who mixes like bands and live shows. Like I learned about in our industry. There's so many. There's so many roles you, you have in the industry, right? So that that was the reason why I kind of went to school and and like just get the knowledge. Like at the end of the day, like the knowledge is knowledge gain, right? Like right, yeah. So before we fast forward now to and and Veer makes a good point <clears throat> in that as far as touring goes, you're well. I guess you were you were set to become a sophomore um, because because. You were about to start your second tour with Stephen when it got cancelled um, mm. due to COVID, but um, you've you you you've made that jump from from 
to to now becoming a touring professional. So mm. so while you are a rookie in the touring world, um, you just kind of touched on some of the things that prepared you for that point. So why yeah. don't you talk a little bit? Because again, one of the things I like to stress on is the fact that there's no such thing as luck. There is the intersection mm. between preparation and opportunity. So mm. you had a bunch of things that you did preparing for that time when you now get the call that you're going to be you're going to take over from me as Stephen Marley's monitor engineer. So so um what 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 things were you doing prior to getting that call for your first tour? And that's kind of crazy that your first tour is with Stephen Marley, eight time Grammy winning mm. artist, right? And and yeah. and you've told me a little bit about your you know, growing up and listening to Bob Marley's music and kind of how mm. important that was in even in your development. Mm. Um, but what kind of things were you doing? What kind of jobs were you doing? And if you can kind of point out some of the 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 jobs or festivals or or anything that that really had a massive impact on preparing you now for that call, because you get the call and you're ready yeah. to go, right? So so what mm. were the things that you were doing leading up to that point? So I'm going to back a bit and tell the story of, so when I met you, right, there was, there was something which I learned at school, like you need to go and see shows. You need to get, you know, you need to go and see how people are mixing shows. Like this is your industry. You need to learn it. Right. Right. So I remember the very first show I came, actually, no, the very first time you hit me up was you were doing a house of Chris gig and you guys were late you guys were a bit delayed. It was with Ashen You guys were a bit delayed with the setup. And and that thing, like for me, I just take it as a blessing from God or even luck, like call it however you So one of my friends went on vacation, actually gave me his car. He's like, you, I'm going on vacation. I'm going to keep the car. So I was in Mississauga heading home and you messaged me. He's like, hey, we need some help here. And did you want to just come and help? Like, obviously, like you mentioned it, there's, there is no pay. We just need... He's just going to give you experience. I was like, yeah, man, I'm 30 minutes away. I'll be here soon. And then I drove there. Actually, yeah, Jennifer was actually with me because we left school at the same time. So we went there um, and we helped you with that. And that's how, how it began. And then after that, there was another show that was happening, House of Praise. And Jamal messaged me. He's like, hey, that was the day before the show. He's like, hey, I've just finished loading and I'm going to need someone. And some people might laugh at it. That's what he says. I need someone to change my batteries in my mic. <laughs> Period. And I was like, yeah, man, I'll come and do it for you. And well, Jamal hits up people to come do work for yeah. free too. That's crazy. <laughs> he was like, I just, he's just like, I have a lot of wireless. I don't think, because he was doing more this by himself, right? And I think right. you were doing front of house on this one. Yeah. He was just like, yo, I just need someone to change the bag on the mic. That's it. I showed up, changed batteries for his mic and and that's how that word kind of began with, you know, working with you and Jamal. And then, so me hanging out with you guys kind of told me a lot. Like, you've always emphasized on your time will come, but before the time comes, you need to start preparing for it, right? right. So, you know, like learning wireless, learning like batching, learning how to troubleshoot things, you know, like all those skills that actually take me to where I am today. Like, I agree, I'm still a rookie touring. Like, you remember my first few weeks of touring, I called you, I was like, yo, can't, I can't do it. Like, uh, I can't, like, that's, I mean, that's and we had to, uh, you know, I'm going to interject there because um, it's funny. Jamal, you know, that, that sort of like tough, tough truth telling that, mm. that Veer does with me is, is kind of the same way I am. Um, and Veer is just like one of the people, but um, it, it's Jamal called me the other night and asked me to listen to a mix, and because um, he's at home practicing as well, and mm -hmm. and I'm I'm my wife is kind of sitting beside me, and um, and 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 um, he he <laughs> Jamal calls me and and he's like, what do you think of this mix, right? And I'm like, um, kind of ripping it. And and she's like, <laughs> she's like, man, you're so mean. I'm like, but how is he gonna get better if I tell him that it's good, and it's not good? And I remember we had to have 
we had to have some locker room conversations in your first few <laughs> weeks out on the road with Steve. I think Veer called me a few times and and was like, "Yo, you need to you need to talk to that. You need to talk to David because <laughs> this this is not going to work." <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I guess the um, you know, they say that that throughout the course of a flight, a plane is constantly off course, but the pilot's constantly correcting. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, it's, it's not the fact that you'll never, ever go off course. It's how quickly mm. you can correct and, and sort of pull your socks up and, 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 and move, move in the right direction. Right. Yeah. Like that's true. And that's one thing which I'm like, cause I remember that like my very first, my very first workshop class, which was with John Natali, Right. Yeah. Um, there was like that thing stays and changed my whole career. Like, so we didn't, I think it was the first or the second practical class. So one of the students threw a tantrum, didn't like the way the teacher talked to him and pretty much walked out of the class. Right. And Junior Tali told us, I say, if you guys want to succeed in this, in this career, go learn psychology 101. Like, right. like, I think the thing that really helped me a lot is like, like you're, you're really hard on me, but at the same time, I don't get offended by it. You know, like for me, I know, if you tell me you're, you're trash, it's, you're telling me for my good. And I would always go and try and fix it. Like, if you tell me you're like this, like, like, for example, for two, I was calling and say, yo, like, I can't deal with that. Like, I can't, why am I having this problem? And you'd be like, you would actually explain to me why I'm having this problem. So then I would try and go back and, and fix it and try to make it better. But I feel like that's one of the main thing in our industry. Like if someone walks to you and say, Hey, like your mix sounds good, but you should probably change this and this. Like a lot of people actually get offended by this. I honestly don't get offended by it right. unless you're just coming to like, you know, to just talk trash. But right. if like, if I have a relationship, like, like same thing with Via, like Via walks to my console and is like, what are you doing here? And he fixes it for me. He's like, and I hear the difference and I'm like, I'm not going to get upset at him for showing me my mistake. You know what I'm saying? Like I would take it as a learning step, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. And of course you're getting heckled in the comments, but that's to be expected because Veer, <laughs> Veer and Drew are, are watching. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but, but, um, okay. Let we, so we, we, we talk about kind of where you're at right now. I think, mm -hmm. um, one of one of the important jobs that that you do and it's not necessarily um you know it it's you are you you kind of crew chief for audio um mm -hmm. for marley brothers and kaya fest um you are a patch patch ninja um and 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 you you help us put together um the writers and stuff so i want to be able to help some people um learn today because obviously we have a lot of people who watch these things and they want to know how to write an effective writer mm -hmm. um how to put it together properly um what information is the key information um which is which is important to to convey to a venue or to a to a production manager or wherever you're going to um and then and then also also executing that patch now um, yeah. one of the things I'm, I'm pretty proud of, uh, it's, it's really high up on, um, on, on my list of, of accomplishments is the fact that we, we ran Kaya Fest with 20 minute changeovers. So just yeah. to paint a picture for, for people watching Kaya Fest is, is a festival unlike any other. It's, um, it's, it's, it, it is, he, it. From one o'clock in the afternoon, I think doors open at twelve, and then the first artist was on stage at one o'clock, and mm -hmm. coffee co coffee was um, the first act. Yeah. And at that time, coffee was like blowing up. So we're talking like obviously last year was a massive year for coffee. Ended up winning the Grammy um, for first female artist to win the reggae Grammy, right? Um, so had a had a fairly big year. And then, so it's coffee playing first. Then we have Third World, which is iconic reggae band. And then Kiss mm. the Band. And it's like headliner, like all these artists would be headlining shows if it wasn't this festival. Like if it was yeah. their own shows, they'd be headlining. David O just um, 
well, his tour got cancelled halfway halfway through um through COVID. through the tour because of COVID. Um yeah. but he was headlining a tour, Live Nation tour, playing playing the same ve- big venues that other people are playing, like playing the Tabernacle mm-hmm. in Atlanta, House of Blues, like um all all these bigger venues, right? And 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 so and this guy's playing like early in the day. Sean Paul is playing when there's still sunlight out. Um so it's a massive festival in terms of the lineup and the undertaking, right? Um mm-hmm. so you have you have you have all these all these artists, headline artists playing from fr- from the time doors open till till the time it closes, Pitbull closes the show, and you have the Marley Brothers, which has a fairly large patch list which we're going to go through and we run this entire festival from top of the day with 20 minute changeovers every artist gets their input list one-to-one um which is important because I'll, every pretty much every engineer is coming in with a file so yeah. you want their inputs to line up and you're not you don't want to be de- like with a 20 minute changeover you're not dealing with patching at that time right mm-hmm. like if you you're just initializing a rack getting that patch one-to-one and we ran that entire show on time down to the minute um, I mean, obviously there's a larger crew that was a part of that that was able to make that happen. But at the root of that is patching and making sure that there are no mispatches. And if there are, dealing with those and troubleshooting those really quickly. I think the only act that started slightly late was Sean Paul was four minutes late because of a faulty DI. And we had troubleshooted the cable was fine and then finally found the DI that was giving trouble and, and switched that out and they started four minutes late, but we made up the time on the next changeover. So that in and of itself is a massive, massive accomplishment. Ash, of course, a big part of that as a stage oh, yeah. manager, making sure to get stuff on and off and in place in a timely fashion. Um, I remember at the end of the day, I had no voice left just from like calling the show and making sure everything was going good. Um, so we want to help people um, even down to a smaller show, implement some of these things that would be able to to give them that success because there's a lot of preparation that goes into a festival like that. Like I, we, I mean, we were having conference calls for weeks in advance leading up and, and talking maybe five to ten times a day, just going over and preparing and preparing and checking lists and checking lists. And then, of course, there were challenges with the production company, which we won't talk about. But, but somehow that preparation leads to 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 executing this incredible festival. Um, so, and you are a big part of that. So, what we want to do is teach people. Um, with <laughs> Junior says, proteges engineers didn't cause any problems at that festival, but his piano player did. So what we're not gonna <laughs> we're not going to remind Junior of these stressful times. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about the design of of designing a system of patch um, that will set you up for success. Then we'll talk a little bit about riders and what what important information needs to be in an artist rider so that when we receive it on the festival side, we can pull the information that we need. And then we'll talk about. Um, then we'll talk about how you execute it. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So, so to paint a picture for those watching, um, there we had three split snakes. So, so we had two consoles at front of house. Um, we had a festival desk, which was an Avid SXL. We had we had a SD7 for the for the Marley Brothers, right? With two SD racks. Um, so 112 inputs because you're running 56 channels on each SD rack, right? Um, there was a traffic desk at front of us, a SD11, that was handling MC microphones, DJ playback, and that all was going into a P1 processor, L Acoustics P1 processor, right? That was kind of combining everything, right? And then on deck, we had one festival monitor console, um, which was a SD10, again with two SD racks, so 112 inputs. Um, and a combination of, and we had a SD12 for traffic at monitors, so so that artists could share the wedge mixes mm-hmm. and the side fills. So even even though they were loading different files and whatever, we we still had a traffic desk to deal with wedges and side fills, and then um, in ears would come off, uh, depending on which rack they were using, right? So so Dav and I designed that system. Um, 
together and we had of course we had waves um on the sd7 at at, at front of house waves was being mirrored so two servers two computers two of the exact same licenses so that you could run redundancy which which we kind of learned in rehearsal how to set that all up and watch tutorials and call 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 our friends at gear audio and figured out how to set that up and then uh, and then of course we had waves at monitors I, I no i don't think any other festival um or the guest acts were using waves at monitors but i was definitely using waves for the Marley brothers and um mm -hmm. were using using waves for pitbull pitbull was using waves yeah. at at <coughs> at um at monitors as well Pointers, yeah. so fairly fairly complex rig we had a combination a sennheiser 6000 series wireless um we had some accent um i think 20 channels of psm 1000 um just a massive like setup right like 20 channels with 40 belt packs so of course we had some friends of ours helping us up on stage um vran was handling batteries and making sure mm -hmm. every artist got fresh batteries i had assistance from akash up on stage yeah. um and ricardo budai was helping you with patch and making mm -hmm. sure di's and microphones were getting into the prep area which was off stage right it was just like a, a machine right so um some of the artists we were only prepping one artist out because the stage is not big enough to like prep every single band and leave them up for the whole day so we had strict schedules with call times for bands to show up to get prepped on the deck and we had an incredible crew from jonas productions handling handling backline um so they were they were taking care of that backline stuff so we were just kind of, our crew was just walking up and setting up mics and patching with the assistance of the touring crews so how does the, so let's explain now if you want to take a minute and explain how how all the all the inputs now get to each desk. So you got uh, S6L for festival at, mm -hmm. at front of house, which is which is all the acts except for the Marley Brothers and um and and um and what's it called and, and Sean Paul. So Sean Paul was using the SD7 as well, and then yeah. everybody else is on the S6L. And then you have a SD10 at front, which is a festival monitor desk. So explain to everybody the, the split system and, and patching, um, how that would all come together. Okay, so first of all, I had two split snake, right? So as let's say I start with coffee, the first the first um well the before first that the day. before that we had three because we had one one that did yeah. all the band inputs for the Marley Brothers that never yeah. got never got um, never got touched yeah never got touched so yeah. the Marley Brothers who are really the headliners of the festival um mm. their all the band inputs never got touched because we could yeah. fit that so SD rack A on the SD7 and SD rack A on the SD10 was dedicated to the to the band the inputs Marley, for the yeah. Marley Brothers so that split mm. never got touched yeah. either so so we'll move on to know the festival patch. Yeah, so the Mario Brothers sound check the day before and you know, like and which is the norm for every like most festival. Like, you know, if you're a big headliner, once you sound check, your input doesn't get changed. Like you're like, you know, because obviously you're the big you're the big act, so you get priority on that. So for the rest of the bands, I had two speed snake, right? So the way I would do it, it has to be alternated along the day so if i start on the first one with with coffee you know I'll, i'm gonna patch his input here right and then as coffee is performing i'm gonna i think i forgot who the, i think third Polish world was, was next third world was next third world was next so as coffee is performing i'm getting ready with with third world right so now when coffee is done third world is ready to go and as third world is playing I start bashing for the third one, which, which was Kiss the Band, I Kiss think. the Band, yeah. So, and it keeps alternating, right? So that allows me time to actually batch it and be ready for them. Now, when it comes to the changeover, right? The fact that we have so many consoles and so many console racks. So the, th the rule number one, when it comes to the console, everything is patched one-to-one. -one. So your channel number one is number one in the console rack, right? So one to 48 or one to whatever, 56. how many inputs it has, right? right? right. And why, um, is, why is that important 
versus doing like a, a festival patch? Um, well, the festival patch happens at the Spit Snake. And the reason why everything happens at the Spit Snake is if, so your number one has to be number one there. If your number one is number 10 and your number two is number nine, if you have a problem, like your brain, you have 48 inputs there. Like you gotta be a genius. Like I'm right. not a genius to be like, you gotta be a genius to be able to figure it out. So that's why the rule number one is your veem leaving the veem that's leaving the 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 split snake right has to be one one for one, and then on your split like your split snake is pretty much like you you're plugging things there right? right so right this can be changed whatever whatever is easier for you like you do whatever you want and so the other thing to understand too is so the input let's say I'm doing coffee right so I patch all my input. So it's it's a three-way split. So you can have three console taking the input right. from from that split snake. So we had two console monitors, and and um front and front of house. So if front of house calls me and say, "Hey, input number eighteen isn't working," right? So the first thing I ask to troubleshoot that is like, "Hey, monitors, are you getting input 18? Right. If he tells me I'm getting input eighteen, so that means my split snake is good, right? I need to go into his rack and figure out why he's not getting input 18. Right. If it were, if it if that wasn't patch one to one for some reason, then it it's gonna take you forever. Like, right. Probably never <coughs> so, be able so, to figure it out. Yeah. So sitting at the so we have patch world sort of away from monitor world to give you space mm -hmm. to work. And sitting there, you have essentially five whips. Uh, mm -hmm. multi w4 for those who know whirlwind w4 connectors yeah um five w4 whips that's going to each console rack right mm -hmm. now yeah. we talked a little bit before the broadcast started about your toolkit when you're prepping your toolkit for mm -hmm. <clears throat> because obviously now labeling and organization becomes very important because yes. you have front of house sd rack a front of house sd rack b main mm -hmm. whips um, you have monitors SD rack A, monitors SD rack B, and then you yeah. have S6L whip, right? Mm -hmm. So you yeah. got fifth, four, five massive whips, and then you've got, I mean, the SD11 kind of stayed patch because that was traffic inputs. Mm -hmm. So, so talk about what you're prepping in your in your kit leading up to such a festival, knowing that okay, one. You're going to have to be incredibly organized. You're going to mm -hmm. have to, because the changeovers are tight. So we don't really, and, and you're getting constant pressure from me because yeah. I'm like, listen, <laughs> I need you to execute these changes in mm -hmm. five minutes to give the band 15 minutes to line check and make sure yeah. that their mixes are good. So you got to get, Ash, Ash comes in, he's got to get the band off, mm -hmm. right? Um, and get the next band on and in, in like three minutes, right, yeah. to give you another two minutes to make sure multi-pin cables are connected to stage boxes. And we're going to get mm -hmm. to patching the risers after. But how important is one, labeling an organization, which is an obvious answer. But two, what's in that kit? What, what do you have in your kit in terms of crucial tools heading into a massive festival like that? <laughs> So here's my approach to how I build my kit. Like a lot of people in our industry don't understand that. So for Kaya Fest, right? Because we had some, we we're, we're not going to say it, but we had some problem with the production company. So our call time was at 8 a.m. I had, I was, we were so lucky that our hotel was actually next door to the venue, right? Right. So I showed up earlier than anyone because I had to take care of some stuff that wasn't taken care of. So I show up on site at 6, around 6, 6.30. And I left the site at at midnight. So midnight was when we were done. So I think I left around 2 a.m. But I worked from 6 a.m. till till 12. So and here's 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 a piece of advice. You need to build a kit to help you. Like remember, your brain cannot function for that for like you know 12 hours for 18 hours, right? Right. So for me, the thing which I carry all the time is like this is the number one tool, a pencil and an eraser, because I need to write things down. I always have a notepad on me because, man, it's like 
a festival like Kaya Fest, like you cannot remember everything. Like, and people have seen me, like I label everything. Like, like even if, if this is number one, I will label it number one. So I always carry a Sharpie, a, note, a notebook. Now I don't really do the notebook thing because I use my laptop a lot because I have that Excel sheet that we'll talk later. Right. Um, Sharpie, um, um, E-tip, um, bring bring the rainbow colors. Don't just bring one color. Like bring like like pe- full, people full who've seen my colors. kit. Like I have right. like fifteen E-tips on every right. Right. colors and a lot of of the white and black E-tip, uh, gaff tape. You know, bring a knife because you will need a knife to, you know, cut tape and do these things. Right, right. Um, um, there's one thing which to this day saves my life so much is the, the XLR sniffer, yeah, right? Huge. It has huge, um, huge. this thing like tells you what's wrong and it saves your, because there's like, there's three, um, there's three LED on this that actually, if, if one pin is wrong, it will tell, this will light up red. So this like helps you troubleshoot things really quickly. Um, there's a trick that I learned as well is, so people who've seen my Instagram, I always wear like a, like a military vest pouch thing. Right. So it's called, I a, bought, it's, it's, it's called a utility vest, but it's okay. Military is fine. Yeah. yeah military, like, you know, be a bit like, you know, bad man crew, you know? Um, so one of the thing which I like with my vest is when I actually bought it, so you can actually put an iPad inside right so what i did is i actually put like um like all my gears are actually like my whole kid is in miami right now because tour got canceled had to come back home like i wish i could show you how it is so what i have is i have like a white like a clear plastic pocket inside so as the as the band are going so my input list stays on my chest all the time so if something goes wrong i don't need to run back to my laptop i just look 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 into my right into my my best and you're constantly like my honest. changing that through the day. It's, yeah. it's whatever yeah. the current yeah. input list that you're working on. Yeah, the is. current input list, the band that's right. actually going on, the input is always there. Oh, if I need to remember something, I'm going to write it down and put it there. So as changeover is happening, I'm going to look at it and do that. Right. Um, and then these are the main ones, like E-tape, you know, Sharpie, XLR sniffer, right. a knife, um, gaff tape, and, and that pouch. Um, the other gears that I'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna say they are crucial. Like a label, like a label printer is great. You know, right, right. It helps you save time. You don't need to. Um, you have that, and then like there's other like you know like a cue box is is great to have. Like a cue box pretty much is like a it generates pink noise, generates the tone to check a line. Right. Um. But yeah, the crucial one or the one the one I've, I've said just earlier. Cool. So, so now you're patch lead. So you're the guy that's doing. You're at. Mm-hmm. You're at the snake at at the um at the 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 splitter that you're doing yeah. all that main patch. Mm-hmm. While you're doing that, you have a patch A two that's patching mm-hmm. the risers, right? Yeah. So you have a list of mics, DIs, <coughs> state the stage box layout that you've designed ahead of time that he's mm-hmm. following. Right. Yeah. So, how does that flow of information happen from you to him? The for for my like, I'm gonna say this like the definition of a patch guy is is simple. Is you need to make sure everyone who's working with you is calm. You need to make sure someone like Red is not gonna yell at you from his console because he doesn't see this input or VI is picking up the phone. It's like I'm not seeing this. So. And you know when me and Veer start yelling, it's not yeah, that's necessarily like, yeah, very it's, kind. Yeah, yeah, it's like it, it comes with all the flowers and everything. So we need to make sure we'll keep the flowers for the end. Um, but that's what I'm saying. Like my job as a patch tech is to make sure you don't panic. You know, I remember it's funny. Like when we did the New Year's Eve gig um, in uh, like the past New Year's Eve, I had to pull aside the patch tech because Jamal got upset because patch was not I pulled the patch guy outside I say hey listen your job is to make sure he doesn't get angry you know because once he gets angry you know it's gonna be like it's gonna be like hey like once someone is upset like you can't it's hard to bring them back to being nice and stuff right right so 
that's the thing. So now, so sorry, what was the question again? So the, f- the flow of information from the flow you information. Now, yeah. So you you design now, like a yeah. cool little system with um, which is what I can't um, what what I want you to kind of touch on. You design a system of getting mm-hmm. information in real time. To yeah. where it needed to be, so you're you're working at the split because sometimes mm-hmm. too you have engineers who come in and say, oh, even though we advance, there's a mm-hmm. change or something, right? That needs to be made. Yeah. They want to add a top back mic. They want to right, and you're mm-hmm. updating that information on your laptop, but you have a really cool system of making sure that the guy who is on the other side of the stage working at the and making sure the risers and the the band is patched correctly is getting yeah. that information real time. So that that's kind of what, what I want you to touch on a bit is that system that you kind of put together. Yeah, so the transfer the transfer of information is very important. So like don't festival like IFS, I can't do it by myself. Like I need a team of people around me. So it's very important that I get my information right first. I know my input list, this is what we're going to use. So until I haven't finalized my input list, I don't I don't, I won't tell that to my, you know, to my A2, you know, like, right. but then once that's finalized, I'm going to walk him through it and be like, Hey, this is the input list. This is what you refer to. But there is a few things. And here's the thing. I look at it. If something goes wrong, the first person that gets yelled at is me, right? Someone doesn't see an input. It's always me. It's not who plugged the cable. It's not who put the mic there. It's that. Why am I, why am I not seeing this input? Right? So, I always label my stage boxes right? because then once it's labeled, if you go with that, it's going with that, right? So this is the thing I do all the time. I label my stage boxes, hand it to the guy. All right, this is for drums. You go ahead and do for drums. Or this is for the, for the keyboard riser, you know, do this for that. So I do the labeling first and then, because once the labeling is done, they just, they just follow, it's just dummy proof, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So so let's let's jump into um if you want to go ahead and share your screen and this takes a little bit of production on my side um mm-hmm. to make sure that folks can see this. But um if you want to share your screen and 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 show people kind of what we put together, um we can start with um how we receive the riders. So if you want to show and we got about 30 minutes till the hour. Today will probably be a little bit longer than the hour. But if you want to show kind of how we receive the riders and and how we put that together. So we had a Google Drive. So KFS riders, these are all. Let's do our good friend, guess the band. Hold on one second, Dav. Let's get let's get this. All right, here we go. I, I asked Dav to hold on so we can go through this properly and get you guys properly set up um, in terms of audio, the audio side of things. So, yeah, mm-hmm. go ahead and show, show the writers how we sort of receive them um, so All that right. people can see. So I'm going to use Guest the Band as an example, right? So this is Guest the Band. By the way, if you haven't seen this, these people live, like you need to go see them live. They are they are amazing so this is Kester Ben right so it's a December 2018 right so for me as a patch tech I usually skip all these so the audio requirements FOH you guys have taken care of that so I usually scroll down backline slice team was amazing so I didn't have to like really worry about that right and so in a I proper would... in a proper festival setup like a yeah. KFS you have dedicated people to deal with dedicated jobs, right? Yeah. So, so you have you have a backline team of people. So we don't even think about backline. Mm-hmm. Like I, yeah. I never at one point, like even though I was doing the advancing along with Veer, mm-hmm. we just sent the backline list to, to yeah. Slice at Jonas, and it was like, yeah, yeah all right, cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a thing where we were trying to trying to figure out. Like, 
what kind of drums was supposed to be on the rider mm. or 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 anything yeah. like that because because really and truly we're not trying to 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 waste time with things that don't really make sense for us as as a as a team as as the audio team so mm. so that's important for people to understand we're not we don't care what kind of drum we just want to know how many pieces right so yeah. we're after we've gone through that that process of now um We've we've gone through the process of advancing the show. We let them know what kind of console they'll have. We provide sort of a a, a festival mic list of what they'll have to choose from. Um, now we're at we're scrolling down to we want to find the stage plot and the input list. Right, that is, that is what's important because we know we need to know we obviously need to know where the things are that need to get yeah. patched and where mm -hmm. they need to get patched into. Right. Yeah, so my so what I go to is for this, which is the input list, which is how many channels they have, what are the inputs, and what mics they're going to use, right? Um, the sub snake and location, I don't really like at the, at, at, at the, at the starting process, I don't really like emphasize on that because a lot of that kind of change sometimes. So I'm just focusing on those first three columns what channel it is, the channel number. What cha the channel name and mics and DIs, and then some people also put if they need a uh, like a mic stand or something. Right. So this is the first thing for every writers that came through. I'm going for that, taking that information, transferring that into my Excel sheet, and starting to prepare for the festival for the festival day. Right. Yeah. And Veer said um, in the comment, yeah, as production manager, Veer is the one making sure that the backline is correct. But f by the time that gets to us, we, yeah. we that, that's that been dealt with already. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we're looking at stage plot now. And, uh, and yeah. of course, some bands will send, like you were seeing on, on Kess's Rider, um, mm -hmm. some bands will send like how they lay out sub snakes. But that is obviously subject to change based yeah. on what we're doing as a festival team because we... we we don't always follow what they have, right? Yeah. And and the piece of advice here is, like, as a patch tech, I don't need to talk to the tool manager or anything. I'm just asking either you or VA, hey, did we get in contact with these people? Because a lot of the times, and it's, it's a common problem, like, I've done festival and I always run into that problem. Someone in management decide to send, send a rider that's, like, in in 2000 right and then they show up on on the festival day and then it's like oh they send you the wrong the wrong technical rider and then at this point you've all yeah you've prepared for the show day and then you realize all the preparation was probably wrong you know like it's always good like a uh, rule of thumb is to like you know ask your production manager or your stage manager hey did you talk to right. someone in the band right. or to the to the tour manager and make sure that or the production manager and make sure that the tech writer is current. You right. Know? And and one of the things is, I think what made Veer and I very effective at the advancing process is that we advanced based on the issues that we have had from the artist perspective, which, mm. is, which is exactly that. Like as the artist crew, um, a lot of the times we do end up going into a situation where the wrong rider was sent by the agent or management. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. we're scrambling, trying to, but that, that advancing process, we took that approach to advancing, which was if mm -hmm. we were the artists, we want to make sure that the correct information and, and, yeah. and thankfully for predominantly for most of the artists, we're friends with their crews as well. So like mm -hmm. I could reach out to Junior or Greg and say, Hey, is this the correct input list for Protege? I could reach out to Brizan for Kessa and say, Hey, is this correct? Mm -hmm. Reach out to Cooley for Sean Paul, be like, Is this correct? Um yeah. David O was a little bit more challenging because they changed stuff um last minute. But but also um and Ash just put it in the comments. I think a crucial part of it was our stage manager, Ash, making sure that yeah. once we had passed on that information to him, mm -hmm. um, that this is what is advanced, this is what is current. This he he wasn't changing any of that, like because yeah. he was the first point of contact when they yeah. showed up for show day. The the first person they reported to was Ash, 
and and mm-hmm. he would make sure they have access to the back line they needed. He was taking care of that pre prep prep time as yeah. a stage manager. So having him be able to 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 um to make sure to enforce the the advance was a very big part of making our job. I I mean it it really really was a complete team effort. Like the the advance process was handled incredibly by Veer um as our as our production manager um and then i of course i was only assisting with that process we were getting show files ahead of time and mm-hmm. and prepping as best as we could to make sure to leave less time less things for the touring engineer to do when they showed up because we wanted them to be able to just load their file and start line checking right um yeah. so so we get these riders now i want to fast forward through so we don't go too far over time um and then and and then so fast forward to now how do we bring all of this information and we choose Kes uh, and I and I want to shout out um Budu for 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 designing an incredible rider like if you guys are looking at this this is what man color coding stuff mm-hmm. be it's easy to read it's easy to find out information it's very clear and concise you don't have to go searching for the information so so shout out to Kes the band for for a really nice looking, please visually pleasing rider, um, yeah. but also having all that important information to, because that turns around and makes it very easy um, at the end of the day. So fast forward now to the system you have and the spreadsheets that you use that that tie mm-hmm. this all together now for every different artist on the day. All right, so I'm gonna jump into my so. What I do is once I take the information that I need from the tech writer, I put that into into an Excel sheet that I've actually, like over the years of of working, I've kind of like designed it to help me be better at my job when it comes to caching. So, all right, right, so KFS, so do. All right, so here's my input list. So. At the top, there's there's different tabs of all the bands we had. Um, so I had Coffee as number one because they were the first one, third world, the second one, and Kess. So remember how I was saying I take from, from from what I took there was the first three column, which was the channel, the channel number, the channel right. name, and the mics and the eyes. So I take that and I type it into into my Excel sheet here. So Here's a way, I'm just gonna quickly run through this. So I do not type the mic list, right? And the reason, so I have a, I have a drop down, a drop down box on my thing. So I have, I have a tons of mic that I have used in the past. Right. Um, and so, and these are, so as I'm having new mics, so my, my mic list gets, gets the, the database, like, you know, gets added as I'm, as I'm encountering new mics, right? So, right. so and, I have all the course, mics that with, I have used here. With with yeah. with the master list in this, which is important, is what Vera and I have um, kind of compiled. So so we looked at every single rider and compiled mm-hmm. three sets of, of a festival mic package to be able to mm-hmm. patch. I, essentially, what we wanted to do was to be able to have three bands patched at the same time. So, yeah. so, so we would have the band on stage, the band mm-hmm. that's coming on, and then the band after the band. So the the, the next band out. So yeah. we kind of pulled, and then of course the Marley Brothers patch list was was separate because they were separate, ne- yeah. that that gear was never touched. Once that was set up the night before and sound check, that was never touched. But in terms mm-hmm. of the festival package, our goal was to have three bands patched at any given time yeah. to allow us enough time. For for and and the people might ask why three because we could only hold twelve risers on the stage yeah. at any time. So we had the, whatever was on stage, um, three or four risers for the next band coming on, and then three or four yeah. risers for the band after that. 
that's all we yeah. could hold for space. So mm. we, we, we designed a mic package that could patch any three bands at any given time and then also okay. have a few spares, like a few spare mm. DI boxes, a few spare of crucial yeah. mics, things like 57s, kind of like your Swiss Army knife microphones. Um, yeah. We would have a few spares of that. So that's kind of how we design. And then we give that list now to David to say, here are the totals. Now you can sort of assign microphones to each band. Go ahead. So, so the reason why I have these in, in drop down drop down boxes is is as if you guys can see that section here, it says guess mic slash di. So what this table is doing, it's actually counting how like see how everything is highlighted here? It's counting how many mics in total that that I will need. So for me. I know exactly to like to the dot, like how many D6 he needs, how many I5 he needs, how many beta 91 he needs. Um, I have, the way I do this is I have a filter here. So actually let me just show like it's, so this is just basic Excel formula. Like, you know, right. like, right. like all it's doing is, so uh, it's just I'm so using many. the count if formula. Right. And it's count. So what it's doing is everything that has the name Audix D6, it's going to count it. Right. So it only sees one. So it shows me there's only one Audix D6. So now when I go for the beta 91, for example, um, here, it's counting in that whole column about beta 91. Right. You know, like, like again, like my Sennheiser 904. So this is it. And, it, and I, I would say this, like, I, for me, this is just basic Excel format. There is no like genius thinking. So if anyone wants that, I've shared it to people. Like, right, hit right. Up, I'll send it to you or hit, hit up Jason and he has a copy of that. He, he's, he'll share it with you. So that's what he's doing. So for me, when I have to transfer that information to Budai, like Ricardo, I was like, hey, this is the exactly what Mike you need for guest to band. So he goes and pull exactly. So it's pretty much like a, like a factory as like, right. kind of like that. You go to the shelf, you pick up exactly what you need and you take that whole pile, Right. go there and like, this is what I need. Right. And same thing with the mic stands. Like I know I need for Kester Ben, this is how many mics we needed. Four right. tall boom, five short boom and two straight. Right. Simple as that. So if I need to delegate that to someone, he's going to tell one of the station, hey, bring me four tall boom. Bring me five short booms. So right. I'd, so and of I'm course, of course he had he had stage hands working with him too, pulling yeah. stuff out of cases and whatever. So having this mm -hmm. information clear, um, it makes it easy because because you yeah. know exactly how mm -hmm. many mics, you know exactly how many how many stands, um, mm -hmm. you know how many cables you're going to need based on the number of inputs that you you have going. So mm -hmm. so it makes it really easy to get that 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 process done. Um, which allows time to, to check your work, right? Because yeah. if you're rushing, yeah. if you're like, oh, man, we need another mic stand. No, you're scrambling. Five people gone mm -hmm. to grab one mic stand, which is what yeah. happens a lot of the times on festivals, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're scrambling and you can't, you don't have enough time to check your work. So that's how you get mispatches because you haven't left yeah. enough time. So, so preparation obviously is, is a massive key to success and, and, mm -hmm. and having that master list imported into that doc uh, document is huge too and having it having it populate the way it is right so i remember the the crazy part about how i actually came up with this idea of like so you know like shout out to soundbox like they've they've helped me they've, they they were the people who like you know when i was at school gave me a job and shout out to you too well that's something you need to explain as well like i'll, I'll we'll come back to that later um, cause you actually gave me some big shows to patch. Right. But I saw that my very first, um, festival patch with sandbox. Right. And the band, who sh like, it's funny, like the band showed up and I had everything patched. It was my first time patching a festival. Right. I had everything ready. They showed up and they were like, Oh, you have the wrong input list. And the guy pretty much like, this is your new input list. And I, it was disaster. Like, also, anyone at Sandbox will tell you that this one was a disaster for me. It was my first one. But I took that. So now if someone shows up and say, hey, we've changed something, right? All I need to do is come here, 
make the changes. Right. And I don't need the brain power to think about it. Like it does, it calculates everything for me. Right. Right. Like, like you might be having a bad day and you put something like that. It exactly tells you what you need. Right. You don't need to be like, cause that's the thing with when it comes to like patching as the pressure goes up, everyone around you starts panicking. Right. Monitor guy is like, yo, are we going to start on town? I'm going to, I was like, what's going to happen? What's happening there, right? So this is what actually helps you to to transfer the information, but also transfer right. the right information. And then we, and we did something cool too, which we had a screen. Um, I mean, I know mm -hmm. initially the plan was, and we're trying to develop a, a greater collaborative system where yeah. where somebody at front of house can view something and make change. It's, it's hard being in a field where you don't necessarily have great Wi-Fi, but mm -hmm. we were using like Google Docs um, yeah. so that if, if, if when the band showed up, Ash would be talking to them and I would run over and be like, hey, input list, microphones, everything is the same. They'd be like, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. If there was a change, I'd go on the Google Doc and make that change so you and could that pull, that, yeah. pull that information in real time. And then mm -hmm. we, were, we were sending that on a screen. We had a screen around stage right, which is where yeah. Ash and um, Buddha was prepping the risers with mm. the latest information that you are yeah. showing here. So that was actually going to a, a screen where where if if you were now working on, let's say you're on KISS, so you're now probably working on, KISS is on stage, so you're working on um, Protégé's Protégé, crunch, yeah. right? So you would, let's say if you click on Protégé, you would be viewing Protégé because you're, you're now working mm -hmm. on Protégé. They would see this, which is the latest Protégé patch, on yeah. that screen. So as he's grabbing microphones, which the case for the microphones and Diaz was right below the screen, mic stands were in that same area. So as he's mm -hmm. looking at this and pulling this, this is what is right in front of him, right? He, yeah. he doesn't have to guess uh, about, you, you know, it's, it's not a trying to use memory and brain power. Because like you say, once you, when, when you start at 8 a.m., we got on site. You were on site at 6.30. And a <laughs> funny story is the production company brought you the mic stand still in the box. Um, boxes, yeah. <laughs> That's why I had to come. That's why I had to come. <laughs> so I remember you. I, I remember, man, I woke up and I went down for breakfast. And, and I was... Um, <laughs> I, I went and you sent me a picture. It's like our mic stands arrived and they're all in boxes. Like, and you have to like assemble like hundreds of mic stands. It's like ridiculous. Ash, don't worry. Tons, we're, tons of mic stands. Tons, tons of mic stands. <laughs> Ash, Ash, have no fear. We're never using that production company again. Um, but, but I mean, like, so we get on site at eight o'clock and it's like work the time we get yeah. there because. The, the cool thing was that the first three bands we could actually set up and sound check. So when we got there first thing in the morning, we sound check Kiss. Um, mm. and, then, and then we rolled off Kiss, rolled on Third World, sound check Third World, and then set up Coffee and Third World was sharing a patch. So we kind of stacked Coffee in front of Third World and then they sound check, did a quick line check and started started the show. So, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's work from the time you get there from 8 p.m. Um, um, eight 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 a.m. till till midnight when the show is yeah. done. Like you never yeah. stop. I mean, we kind of yeah. we kind of sat down. I think I sat down for the first time when Pitbull went on stage, which mm. was like at ten fifty five, like five minutes to eleven. I sat down for the first time and Yusef came over and was like, "Bro, <laughs> you okay?" Because I literally <laughs> couldn't move. Like I, I sat yeah. down. I was like, "I was I was done." Um. Mm. Because because that 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 is how like that that's just how the day goes when you're on a big festival like that and 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 I, I mean a lot of what we were trying to do is one prove a point um, that that reggae festivals can run effectively and on time yeah. which we were able to do um, you know it the 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 changeovers I remember initially they came and said we're going to do half an hour changeovers and I'm like yeah no problem and then they come back like a week later and be like we need to cut that to 25 minutes and I'm like yeah no problem and then they come back a week later and go alright it's going to be 20 minute changeovers and I'm like alright now you guys get in a little bit carried away with this yeah. thing right <laughs> um, yeah it was it, it was something else um, it was something else so, so having this information like right in front of everybody who needs to see that information is mm -hmm is 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 so important and and yeah. and that's what i think impressed me the most working with you was like yo like this man 
have and and that pre, that helps you not get flustered because yeah. everything is right there so you can just yeah. look up at a piece of paper like if i come and ask you yo where's this patch you you pull it up in in mm. seconds i have the answer um yeah. and 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 then it keeps everything organized so as you're patching now too because go now to the right side of the page which is where the the case patch is now and that color coding and explain to people watching what that is because there's also a power element to that as well right and how we design that 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 setup so my approach to to color coding is is this is is i can it's easier to tell someone go it's like it's easier to tell someone go pick an orange from a tree you're sure they won't come back with an apple right right but once you start getting and that's the thing with with stage and like like I don't know who the station is. And that's the thing. I went, I flew to Miami. The only person I, I've worked with was only you. And I'm working with the whole crew. And luckily, stage manager was great. You know, the guys from Trinidad, like solid crew, like, you know, Akash is still country from Trinidad, you know. But um, like these guys were great to work with. Like, you know, even first time working with Via, like everything on point, like everything was great. So the reason why I always use color coding is, if I have the worst crew ever, everyone knows what's brown, everyone knows what's red, everyone knows what's orange, right? right? And in our industry, we have the register color code. So brown stands for number one, red stands for number two, and so on. Like see orange, yellow, and green. So for me, all my, so we're talking about that, uh, the, the cable that goes to your, to your stage boxes, it gets unplugged, right? So I have a brown, a red, orange, a yellow, uh, and a green, right? Right. That those, goes those, to the gotta, stage. Th those cables stay run yeah. for the entire day. You're just changing yeah. them from snake to snake, right? Yeah. So, so what, yeah. what Ricardo is doing at the back is he's plugging. So once I label my boxes, right? This is my drum box, right? I also put a brown tape on it. So I know it's a brown box. So I say, hey, this is for the drums, right? So he's going to patch everything. So... When the risers comes in, what I'm doing is I'm taking that brown cable, it gets plugged into the stage box of the of the um of the drum, right? And, right. and that's how I get all the inputs from the drum. Well, correction, now, I was doing that, but that's fine. <laughs> I was on stage connecting the stage box side. You were at the snake dealing with the moving it on the snake side on the patch mask. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then also, I, I want to point out here how important that color coding is and, and being clear with your label, labeling. Mm -hmm. And Ash, I'm going to hit you up. I see Ash commenting. We need to have Ash as a guest on Learn From The Pros. So Ash, when I'm done right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a note on WhatsApp so we can um, hash out a date. But the, the, the guy who was running power <laughs> spoke very little English. Um, I, don't, I don't know if people here... If people on this watching this broadcast have ever been to South Florida, but I call I I I call South Florida North Cuba, right? Like I like I am serious. The 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 Uber drivers nobody speaks English. Like Uber Eats, if you ever need to get an Uber Eats um, delivered to the rehearsal room, um, heaven help you because nobody speaks English and and mm. GPS never finds it. Um, but yeah, like our entire stage crew was predominantly dudes who only spoke Spanish. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember I remember when I was trying to like explain to the guy who was responsible for power, um, I just was like, red, red. <laughs> plug it. But, plug red into red, bro. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it's crazy. So having that system of 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 um of, of organization and color coding and, and having mm. enough tape to do that is crucial and then having it on the screen so that the guy who is prepping the, the 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 riser so if he's patching drums he knows okay here's all my inputs he doesn't even have to necessarily look at the left side because mm -hmm. he already knows what kind of mic is going where he's just he's just patching that it's it's and it becomes repetition throughout the day because yeah. every input list looks the same right you're not yeah. asking somebody to go dig through a rider and mm -hmm. and and i've seen it done 
They, they, um, I've seen it done the other way where I show up to, and on big festivals too. Um, one of the reasons why you're my patch ninja is, and I'm calling you every time I'm given the opportunity to hire the crew is because I've been to like the hangout festivals or the big festivals where mm-hmm. when I show up to discuss my patch, they're leafing through a massive binder to, yeah. with a, with a tab that says shaggy. And they're like, okay, yeah, I found it. And it's my rider. Mm-hmm. And there's yeah. no... There's no flow to it because now mm-hmm. they're trying to figure out when I get there, where do I put stage boxes? But mm-hmm. this is already laid out. It's already yeah. color coded. It's already so it, it's very, it's very, it makes it easy as you get tired throughout that day because now it's just repeating what you're seeing in front of you, which is, which is important. And that's the thing too, like you mentioned, like, like, and, and that, that's a good example. Like, it's true. Like, Communication with the production crew was really hard for me personally. One is a lot of people don't get my accent. Secondly, it, there, there was a language barrier, right? So that's what I got him to do with his with his power. Because remember, power is very crucial. If one circuit goes off, like for example, keyboard stops playing. Like there's you know you can't play keyboard without power, right? Right. So I had him color code each of his circuit, right? So for me, if let's say and let's say I always use red as stage right. Um, so if I lose power at stage right, I just look to him and say, hey, the red circuit isn't working. So for him, he has probably tens and like a lot of cable at the back. When he goes there, he sees that first, he sees the red cable. It's, it's, it's straightforward. It's, you're giving people direction by using these colors. You don't need to say, hey, I don't have, I don't have the... Because remember, we have um, like thousands of hundreds and thousands of cables on stage. Right. How do you trace a power cable right. to find which one isn't working? But if you color code both ends, you right. say, hey, my red isn't working. Right. It's quicker to troubleshoot right. and quicker. To and, and so just so people understand, uh, understand that when we designed patch, we didn't only design XLR patch with stage boxes, but we designed power to go along with that. So let's mm-hmm. say your drum riser was brown. We would put yeah. a motion laboratory's um, main power box that takes mm-hmm. a 30 amp twist lock on that drum riser. So when you ran the snake, uh, mm-hmm. the brown the, the brown sub snake would be attached to a brown yeah. 30 amp power cable that would go there, and then and then your stage right riser would be your red, which would have yeah. your red stage box and your red 30 amp cable that goes into that motion labs, um, mm-hmm. and then and then you would have your stage left, which would be orange, right? Which would yeah. be your your power cable. So you have three power cable, three main power leads, 30 amp leads that go to mm-hmm. these boxes along. And Ash says, it's funny, when we designed it this way, the production company actually asked us why we needed that many Motion Labs boxes. Because um, mm-hmm. he thought we could just like prep the risers with quad boxes and then just yeah. kind of... No, but we wanted it to roll on. We wanted those risers to roll on with a power box and a sub-snake box beside it. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. just quickly plug in a, 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 a yeah. multi-pin cable and a 30-amp cable. And, and yeah. your patch is done. Your patch and power is done. Um, mm-hmm. And then anything anything outside like that needed auxiliary power, we kind of... Like if you had a guitar amp downstage or something, we would have those run and coiled ahead of time, right? So we mm-hmm. knew that power because power is an important part of patching and that change over time just as an XLR box is is important, power is equally as important. So so that's so, kind of how we designed that to work together. So on that same note of you know getting the right information, so I I have a tab for each pen, but then I have another tab here that says mic stands needed. So what this is doing is it's again, it's like, you know, like when I send out that Excel sheet, you see, so what it's doing is it's telling me exact. So on one sheet I have for all the bands, how many, how many mic stands coffee need, how many mic stands, third world case, etc. And I also take into consideration, remember we're using wireless. So these, the antennas need my sense as well. So this gets added on here. Our tech talk back. Kes had the, the my mix, so we had to I get extra mic stands for them. But for me, I can tomorrow I'm we're doing the same festival with the same band and everything. I can easily say, hey, I will need a minimum of 25 tall boom, minimum of 27. So if I show up on site, which was the case, 
for via every day i was harassing via via i don't have enough mic stands it's not gonna happen right and via was like yo what's wrong with this guy harassing me every day about mic stands but that was the crucial part for me i knew there wasn't 25 tall boom so my festival cannot happen without 25 tall like a minimum of 25 tall boom right you always go extra because mic stands break but for me if i don't see 25 tall boom when i show up on site on show day I already know it's going to be disaster. Like, and it's, so, it's yeah, crazy yeah. because we shared this document with the production company. You kind of have to ask yourself how some how does somebody miss this stuff, right? Like, sure. these documents were shared with, so they were seeing exactly what we're seeing, and and yet mm. still showed up on site and be short mic stands. It's kind of crazy because it's like all there. <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, do you have the mic page, um, like with all the microphones? Um. I, I think, think they, I there was a total page, May, maybe in a different document, but yeah, and yeah. and and people will notice that there's there's some stuff where where people are sharing mic stands between the different actually and stuff. Yeah, I have it. I have it here. So if you look at that section, the sharing section. So I've actually color coded. So see the brown part. So coffee and third world were actually sharing. So Kess and Sean Paul were sharing mic stands again. So the yellow was Protégé and Davido, they were sharing. Um, Marty Brothers had their own, right? So if I click on here, you see all those colors get, get light up there. So it's actually counting. So for example, in my brown section, the third world needs more tall boom, right? So I take that into consideration. Right. For the red section, it's four. So I'm adding these. Again, as, and that's the way I've done it. So if somebody showed up and say, hey, we are changing our numbers of mic stands. As I change it on my, over there, this gets updated here. Right. Because I use the formulas to link them, right? So again, like it, it reduces your chances of making mistakes. And, and you know, like if let's say the night before you're like, hey, we need to redo the whole mic stand list. So for me, I'm like, yeah, man, whatever you want to do. So I just update it and I say, oh, this is the new numbers that we need, right? Right. So, it doesn't take me a long time to actually right. find out what I actually need, right? And that's also very crucial because with stuff getting updated and information flowing quickly, um, mm. I mean, as quickly as like we're in the middle of the show and I remember, um, I think it was Stella who walked up on the stage and said, hey, um, I should remember this. <laughs> they called me backstage and they're like, listen, um, DJ Khaled, just called and he he, he oh, yeah. called Stephen and he wants to come and um, perform, and so Stephen said yes. So we want to slot him in in a changeover. Yeah. I'm like, how? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this makes no sense. So I was like, well, let's put him on the side, like where the DJ is playing. And they're like, no, it's like an actual performance. So they want him in the middle on the stage. And yeah. Asha and I kind of looked at each other like. Yeah, these people have lost their mind. <laughs> like, there's no way. Um, but again, being able to have information flow quickly um, mm -hmm. is is incredibly important. Um, yeah. I want to take some questions, and then we're gonna close. We've already been like an hour and twenty two minutes. I mean, actually, is, I want to show. Yeah. So this this is what I use for Kaya Fest. I actually updated and came. Because here's the thing, here's the way I work. If I find something doesn't work at 100%, I always update it. Um, I want to share um, my current, the one that I actually use um, these days. All right. You see that Excel sheet? Um, it's not open yet. Um, okay. I'm seeing your screen still, but it didn't open up yet. There we go. All right, so this one, I added a few things because I realized as a, a, now everyone bring their own capsule, everyone bring their own, you know, right. like, like mounts and everything. So this is what I added here that, that kind of like, um, that kind of like take that into consideration. And then I also added that. So I, so what I did is, for example, this is why right now, if I need, if it's going on Subsnake Brown number one, I'm gonna type Brown zero one, and it 
it's it's all like again it's formula as it makes it brown nice um and i also nice. added a cable count as well so right which is very crucial like if you don't have enough cable you can't patch patch the band right, right. so i added so now i know exactly how many cables i need right right how many you know how many for example this is like for Stephen Marley's um, um, uh, input list. So I know exactly how many um, the the clip for the 1499 I need. The other thing which I started doing is I did a Bollywood gig. It was the band showed up like two, three hours late and they actually changed the input list. Right. And I had this ready and it actually saved my life that day. It's funny, like Matt Lauder is the one who taught me a lot about patching. And he was the monitor guy on this. And after the show, he came to me. He's like, dude, you've actually gone a lot of bed. I was like, what? You didn't have hope in me? He's like, nah, man, you saved my life today. And then so, but what I usually do now is, and the crew I work on that Bollywood gig were like old people from Hamilton. Like, right, right. They, it's like, you need to understand that. Like they've, they're pretty much retired stage tech, right? right? So what I would do is I would, so this one is my blueprint the left side right. this one is a mirror image of whatever i i input here so now what i do here is i would come here and do like something like sort ascending right, right. so now over here i know exactly for my brown snake what i need and i would do the calculation here so it helps me again do another layer of right if, if there's a language barrier or anything, you can be like, hey, I need, I need, like, for example, like, I would say I would need this mic on the tall boom. It, right. Like, you don't need to be a genius. Like, it helps you to communicate better with your crew. Right. Um, that's why I kind of added these little things to help me. Again, the, the cable, I need X amount of 15 feet, X amount of 25, X right. amount of right. 50 right. feet. Right, right, right. And, yeah, so you're not just trying to figure that stuff out on the fly. It, it, it's... <laughs> yeah. it's it's allowing you, uh, man, that's incredible. So next yeah. Kaya Fest will be even better, Ash. You hear that? So <laughs> Ash is watching, so he's holding you to it now. You, yeah. you won't be able to get away. But listen, man, I want to I wanna see if anybody has any questions. If not, yeah. um, then we can start to wrap up because we've been at it now almost an hour and a half. I know. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a lot of people been... Um, We've had a consistent number of viewers, so I know people are getting a lot of value out of this. Um, mm -hmm. Listen, guys, the, the fact is, as engineers, we can't do what we do um, if we don't have um, effective patch people. Like it, 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 it's a, like I said, I keep stressing, it's an entire team team effort. And the reason why you come on the road with us with the Marley Brothers, anything that we're doing with the Marley Brothers, we have to have our patch guy because again we're going into we have a fairly complicated patch and we're going into we're going into a lot of times we're not dealing with people who speak english like it's mm. um we're playing places that don't don't um don't have the that, that don't speak the same language so the language barrier is a real thing mm. um <clears throat> what should mu drew says what should musicians do when the stage hands are messing everything up and nothing is patched right um, hand them a card for Veer and tell them to hire our crew. <laughs> that's, that's what you should do. No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. I mean, it can be frustrating, um, and, and not every band has the budget necessarily to bring their own patch guy. Um, it's a hard one, but um, I, usually a lot of that is, is, is just doing things way in advance. Like one of the things I do with um, with with Shaggy is when we, especially when we go to somewhere where we know it's a different language, um, I show up really early. Um, if it's a festival, I want to get there way before call time. Um, make sure that they have the right information. Make sure that we advance the right information. Make sure they have the correct input list. And sometimes it, even then, it's it's still difficult. But you you know you got to roll with it. But Ash said it too. Hire us, <laughs> like hire, yeah. hire our Garfest crew. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, if you dav, we we'll, we're gonna share um this document on Patreon mm -hmm. um for the general group. So so if you are watching, head over to patreon.com slash Jason Reynolds Pro Audio. Even if you sign up for the community, um, which is where we share all of this this information, um, is is definitely where 
uh, you'll be able to find this. We're going to share this document there. So, Dav, you can go ahead and, and, and drop that in the Discord. Um, yeah. And also, if you send it to me, or when you drop it in the Discord, I can put it on the Patreon site as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we want to we wanna thank everybody for, for watching today. Um, thank you for being a part of Learn From The Pros, man. Like we, you know, like I always tell people, we just, we just started this for, for really to share information and to help people learn and, yeah. and stay connected in this time. Um, everybody who comes on learn, learn from the pros is, is really giving their time, um, for free thing. And we ain't getting paid to do this, but we want to help people and we want to, um, do our part in this, in assisting this industry get better, you know? So be a part of the community. Um, in the description of this video, there's a link to the Patreon site. Um, join our community. Um, we're always bouncing ideas back and forth. We're always trying to help people get better. Um, if you want to take your mixing to the next level, we've got Mix Masters. We've got Mentorship. Um, we've started this week with our mentorship, mentorship sessions, and they've been going incredibly. So, um, yeah. Let me let me see if I think I think Dav, you have a your aunt from Australia says she didn't understand much, but she's proud to be watching anyway. So that, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, definitely, and, mind, and, yeah. and we'll look out. Ash, I'm gonna send you a I'm gonna send you a note for when we can have you on. Um, I think that's important to to for people to understand what the job of a stage manager is and 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 how important and crucial it is to to having good success so again guys thank you for watching um join us tomorrow drew keys is on tomorrow and drew yep. is going to be covering ableton for playback um and he's going to be covering midi and and all sorts of things so we're going to have another learning session tomorrow and i'm um, looking forward to it thanks again dav appreciate you bro peace thanks thanks for having me all right thanks guys